Good afternoon. My name is Brian Carey, VP of Marketing here at Unbound Medicine. Thank you for joining us today as we should present to you a series of short webinars titled COVID-19, Are We Getting Ahead? Today, we will be discussing the latest in diagnostics. This pre-recorded presentation will last about 10 minutes. Please feel free to chat in the window provided and ask questions from fellow listeners. The recorded webinar will be shared with everyone via email within your ABX app in the Message Center, posted to Relief Central's coronavirus guidelines, and uploaded to the Unbound Medicine's YouTube channel. Now, please let me introduce our presenter, Dr. Paul Alwater. Dr. Alwater is the Sherilyn and Ken Fisher Professor of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, serving as the Clinical Director for the Division of Infectious Diseases and Director of the Center for Environmental Infectious Diseases. He serves as the Executive Director of the Johns Hopkins Point of Care Information Technology Pocket Center, producing the Johns Hopkins ABX, HIV, Ostler, Psychiatry, and Diabetes Guides. In 2018, Dr. Alwater served as the president of the Infectious Disease Society of America, the largest professional society worldwide related to infectious diseases. At this time, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Alwater. Thank you, Brian, and uh, welcome to uh, an installment of COVID-19, Are We Getting Ahead? Uh, we are uh, trying to present some uh, new information uh, of course, uh, this uh, changes very rapidly and uh, is of April 16th, 2020, uh, for those uh, to please take note. We'd like to center now on diagnostics for COVID-19. I think it's important that we're really beginning to learn more about this disease behavior, but I think our initial early understanding is that this virus for people that become significantly ill has two phases. An early uh, stage of infection, which is often flu-like, going into uh, respiratory symptoms that uh, people have high viral carriage, and then uh, for some people that don't remit their symptoms, there can be between days five and 10, an intense inflammatory phase that uh, really is driven by intense cytokine um, uh, cascades and causing uh, lung injury, such as ARDS, uh, septic type pictures and shock. This um, aspect here is a little different than classic ARDS driven by macrophages and neutrophils and is likely more like influenza related ARDS, which is a T regulatory cell disorder. But there can be a whole host of manifestations. And as we try to understand this, the later stages of diseases appear in many patients, of course, to have lower amounts of viral carriage when the respiratory specimens are assessed. So um, that makes um, uh, diagnostic testing a bit problematic, uh, depending on the limitations we have now. So uh, people that do present, uh, of course, everyone focused on the respiratory and the early flu-like symptoms with more experience. I think we're noting that fever and cough uh, may not always be found early on, especially in patients who are quite elderly or, for example, in renal failure. Uh, we're also uh, uh, adapting to descriptions that early GI symptoms can be heralding, similar to influenza, and, and maybe an indication that those patients have uh, worse uh, uh, and more severe COVID-19 disease. Um, uh, we've had a, a number of practitioners and reports uh, in the early uh, literature so far of loss of taste and smell, which seems to be, um, although nonspecific, uh, seen with some frequency with our COVID-19 patients. And of course, the leukopenia in patients who are more severely ill and requiring to be hospitalized remains a, a prominent feature. Early on in the epidemic, uh, uh, quotes of 4% mortality rates and so on were often quoted. And I, I just think we really don't know, uh, but the best information I've seen is from Imperial College, which looked more closely at the early Chinese experience out of Wuhan and thought that the mortality rate was lower than initially advertised at 1.38% 
But if asymptomatic infections were also included, it fell to 0.66. Now, uh, seasonal influenza uh, is typically quoted as having a 0.1% uh, case fatality rate. So uh, this is definitely more severe than seasonal influenza. Don't tell anyone otherwise. And uh, it uh, may have a higher mortality rate that it could be between six to 12 times higher. Um, uh, certainly making that case. And don't forget, this is a brand new virus, so we really don't have any protective immunity, which also uh, makes uh, probably for higher viral carriage in people that are transmitting uh, as well. So there are a number of factors, and if a higher viral inoculum is acquired, that may also be potentially another factor contributing to severe disease. The early U.S. experience so far, a few reports that may be of interest. Uh, this one, I think, uh, came out uh, during the same time as spring break for a lot of college students. Um, and I did carry the message that even young people um, are subject to hospitalization, including the ICU. Uh, the early Chinese data tended to have the message that younger people are not uh, prone to illness. And while this may be true for children and young adolescents, it is not true for those who are older uh, and young adults or millennials. So I, I do think this message hopefully has been repeated and is now more solidly true, although um, clearly less prone to severe disease or death, um, but uh, not immune uh, for severe illness. So uh, additionally, the COVID net is a collection hospitals in 14 states, and uh, they gave a snapshot of what uh, COVID-19 disease has been in uh, the contiguous United States. And much like our early data from China and well as Europe, it is clearly a disease where the rates of hospitalization most afflict the elderly, and of course, uh, nursing homes, and cruise ships uh, where there's an older demographic have certainly been more hard hit. Of that nearly 1,500 patients, uh, three quarters have been over 50 years of age. Much like in China, there's a male predominance with underlying health conditions. I think the news that has gotten a lot of our attention compared to the Chinese data is that obesity has come up as a frequent finding in nearly half of patients, and that in many of these areas, the rates of hospitalization for Blacks is higher than their um, presence in the communities. And we've certainly uh, believe we're seeing that here in Maryland and Baltimore as well. So um, exactly what are all the attributable reasons aren't clear? Is it genetic? Is it socioeconomic? We're not sure. Hypertension, I think, remains controversial, whether it's an independent risk factor. I don't believe it's really been highlighted as such in, in good studies, uh, but is probably more age-related. But clearly, people with comorbidities are more prone otherwise. In terms of the intensive care unit experience, uh, Europe, uh, and specifically Northern Italy, um, really had overwhelming numbers of older patients in their communities require ICU care. Uh, the ages are definitely older uh, with a general range quartile of 56 to 70 um, with most men uh, and a mortality rate about 26%. The early experience out of the Pacific Northwest uh, had similar ages, but a higher mortality rate, although many of those were patients from nursing facilities. Uh, uh, here at Johns Hopkins, we tend to have a younger population in our ICUs, um, uh, and we have been proning more patients, perhaps 50% or more, and our mortality rates have been, um, excuse me, lower than 20%. And uh, uh, of course, still early in our experience here to truly know. So why I wouldn't want to put that reporting out there right now. Uh, in terms of diagnostics, uh, the reason I showed all that clinical data is the following. Uh, over time, I think we've clearly understood that the molecular testing of nasopharyngeal aspirates is nowhere close to 100%. 
The sensitivity, I don't think anyone truly knows, but the guess is 70 to 85% range. Um, that could be because of specimen collection issues. It could be um, other factors such as assessing later in illness when vir viral carriage is low. But the point is in the current setting with widespread community disease, uh, much like with influenza, if you have a high clinical suspicion and the illness fits without an alternative explanation, uh, if you have a negative swab, I would not count that as proof that you're not dealing with COVID-19. So the diagnostics, much like an in influenza with the rapid influenza diagnostic tests, uh, really mean that in the current era of, I'd say, April and March in uh, North America, a negative test in an appropriately uh, suspicious patient uh, should not be taken um, as meaning they don't have the disease. Uh, so uh, we probably are needing to wait for an excellent set of serology that we can truly trust as representative of COVID-19 and compare that to the nasopharyngeal swabs um, testing to really get an understanding of the exact sensitivity and specificity of these tests. Over the past few weeks, the um, uh, standard RT-PCRs, which usually take eight plus to 12 or longer hours to run, um, have been supplemented by uh, more rapid tests, the Gene Expert by Cepheid, or the ID uh, Now um, platform by Abbott, which was uh, previously uh, under a company called Allaire. Uh, and uh, can really give answers much shorter. We don't quite know how those sensitivities compare uh, and uh, probably have the same caveats. Uh, so um, uh, we'll just, uh, they may indeed have roles uh, and we're using the Cepheid uh, device here at Johns Hopkins to help with understanding and triaging patients for bed uh, assignments. Um, serology is now uh, available. There have been many companies and in-house labs that have developed serological tests, but uh, I think this caution is needed, and this has been also true from the FDA, because many of them have not, or most of them have not been sufficiently clinically validated. So a negative or positive test cannot be taken to truly indicate that you have COVID-2 infection. Uh, and importantly, it's not clear it correlates with protective immunity. I, I believe uh, tests will come out hopefully in the next few weeks that have been sufficiently um, analyzed, especially against live virus to see if those antibodies provide protective immunity. But until that time, uh, we have been very cautious here at Johns Hopkins about using serology because we feel it could give people false senses of security if they think they're seropositive. We don't know if the tests are cross-reactive uh, against other coronaviruses and so on. So I, I think these are important details and uh, I, please, uh, we, we have not been really uh, at all endorsing uh, serology for outpatients. Where we've been using it is in the hospital and somebody with a molecular test negative, but they've been ill with a uh, COVID-like illness, and perhaps it's day 10 or 14 of illness, and then we are um, checking uh, serology. Uh, and the uh, last slide I'd like to go over is a bit complicated, but I think highly instructive on many points. This is from a German group that looked at nine patients who are not severely ill, um, uh, and some were asymptomatic, but it very carefully examined them daily uh, for the trajectory of their COVID-19 infection and the viral carriage. Uh, so uh, a few points to take here. If you look at panel A, uh, this is a viral RNA, and the impression here that you can take home is that so many remain swab positive uh, uh, going into their second and third and even uh, close to their fourth week after onset of symptoms. So viral carriage there can continue for quite a long time. Now, is that infectious virus? Well, if you pop down to panel F, uh, there that's uh, uh, looking at positive cultures and you can see by day 10 
None in this cohort were culture positive, which suggests the the MR the uh, viral RNA being detected is no longer likely infectious. And if you pop up to the D panel, you get a sense that as people begin to mount antibody responses, the, the yield of a positive culture declines and such that by day 10, uh, people begin to have very good antibody responses and are 100% at day 14. So I think this is illustrative. Uh, of course, this is not reflective of patients who are immune suppressed or hospitalized, who might have infectious virus for longer or have different viral kinetics, but I think does speak to the fact that uh, repeated uh, viral uh, uh, molecular testing uh, in the uh, nasopharynx doesn't really reflect an infectious state, but yet that's really the only surrogate we have. So for patients to come out of respiratory isolation in hospital, uh, we're still counting on two sequential uh, negative tests. So uh, remains more to be understood, but uh, this I think has given some very helpful insights into understanding the dynamics of the disease. So again, I wanted to thank you for listening. I hope you found this information helpful. Uh, if you have questions about the Johns Hopkins Antibiotic Guide or any other guides, you have uh, a, a um, website and email there. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you, Dr. Alwater. And thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. For more information about the Hopkins Guides, visit hopkinsguides.com. Also, we've opened all of the topics related to COVID-19 on the site. So that can be referenced from anyone from any computer worldwide. If you have any questions about anything about the guides or about this webinar, please contact sales at unboundmedicine.com. Thank you so much. Stay safe and have a great day.